Welcome to The Riff, where writer and investor Bern Hobart and I discuss the major inflection points caused by technological change. Our weekly conversation covers the obvious and not so obvious ways in which markets and businesses will adapt as a result. Let's jump right in. Welcome, everybody. We're here today joined by a very special first guest on the podcast. Uh, Tom, welcome to the to the podcast. Thanks for joining the Riff. Thank you for having me, Eric. Bern, why don't you briefly introduce why you're excited to, to have him on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, Tom and I have talked for, uh, for a long time about hedge fund and hedge fund related stuff. Um, we both worked at the same fund back in the day, and we have both since um, left left that world and um, not not gone especially far. So I have a newsletter uh, often write about hedge fund stuff, and um, it's often read by hedge fund people. And he has a company that uses um, powerful AI and machine learning techniques to rapidly assemble financial data into exactly the format that financial analysts need it in, and um, allow them to quickly update their models, check their work, um, compare KPIs across different industries, sectors, et cetera. Um, I hope I've gotten your pitch uh, pitch perfect. But um, yeah, it's uh, Delupa. I use it a lot. It's uh, just like the fastest way to get a model that you can easily start using and start double checking. And disclosure, the diff has been sponsored by Delupa from time to time. Great. Before getting into, in, into some of the specifics on some of the hedge fund stuff, why don't you give a, a somewhat brief overview of what do you think venture capitalists like myself who are you know deep in venture but don't know much about hedge funds, when, when you think of the stereotypes VCs have about hedge funds, wh- what are they wrong about or don't fully appreciate or, or what's something non-obvious? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the, the most non-obvious thing is how different hedge funds are. Uh, because I think when you look across all of VC, for the most part, it's a homogenous type of a product. Uh, that you're offering to your LPs, right? You you can differentiate in your sector, you can differentiate in how you source deals, um, but for the most part, the work is relatively similar. But if you went into two different hedge funds, you could think that you're working in a totally different industry, right? Like the hedge funds, hedge funds are are less about um, a, a style of investing and really more about how do you create institutional alpha and you have so many different ways of doing it. There are hedge funds that behave more like a research organization at a university, and there are hedge funds that are, you know, entirely human-driven, gut-check uh, type type profile, and everything in between. Yeah, I would add that one of the differences is that, like, there's like definitely venture firms do differentiate themselves from one another, or at least try to. Um, but a lot of the differences have to be kind of illegible. There's a, you know, there have been studies on things like if if you're if you're a VC and you went to this particular school, that a huge fraction of your portfolio companies will be at that school. And that if you're a VC in this location, like most of your funding is within, you know, 20 miles of wherever you have to be located. And I mean, some of that is just like the center of the universe for venture and the center of the universe for tech are a very quick Uber ride away from each other. But some of it is that if you're, if you are a venture investor, you like one of the differences I would say between a hedge fund and VC is that hedge funds have, um, for the most part, just unlimited deal flow. Like there's not a stock you can't get into. There's not uh, you know a, a swap you cannot trade. But um, they do have to differ- differentiate on research. And then with um, with venture, often the differentiation is not um, can you figure out that this is a good deal. It is conditional on everyone in the world realizing this is an amazing deal, can you actually get in and what kind of allocation can you get? And that tends to be a lot more network driven, but it's kind of weird. Like people, I think people are more comfortable investing in someone based on their experience and skills than based on who they know and who those people know. But that just has to be a big component. And it's like a useful component. Like it's if if everyone gets too many pitches to thoroughly review, they have to look at the warm intros first and those warm intros the warmest of intros are intros from people that they have funded before or people they've worked with before. And um, those there's often, you know, a selection effect in terms of who are your, like, how good are you at what you do and how good are your peers at what they do such that you can, you can estimate that those are going to be the, the, the pretty good deals. So like, that's, that's one way to differentiate it. It is like, if you had limited, like it's, it's a question of, are you limited by deal flow or are you limited by something else? And if you're, if you're not limited by deal flow, then you count as a hedge fund. Yeah, that, that makes sense. The ways venture capital firms differentiate are 
often be a sector. You know, some people focus on fintech, some people focus on crypto, some people focus on hardware, you know, but it's still largely all tech companies. And then you know, some firms focus on stage, you know, uh, whether it's pre-seed or, or growth, but it's still within the same kind of companies. Whereas, yeah, as you, as you say, hedge fund can be just totally different um, strategies. I, I sort of want to get a sense of the, of the landscape and, and be more specific there, but maybe first we could start with a bit of the history. Uh, and how this sort of uh, all, all began and, uh, and, and evolved. Uh, Bern, you have a great overview in your capital gains. Um, is there, why don't you give a, a, a brief history going back to the, the original uh, Jones uh, you know, pod structure? Yeah, so hedge funds were sort of created as um, maybe not, in a, not entirely a legal loophole, but like there's, um, after the Great Depression, there was this whole legal apparatus around what can you call yourself if you are managing other people's money and what can you charge and how can you charge and what can you trade and what can't you trade, et cetera, such that um, mutual funds were, were pretty restricted to they're buying stocks or they're buying bonds and they're not using leverage and they're not touching other asset classes. But it turned out that if you had a partnership with fewer than 100 people, um, oh, and, and the mutual funds, they had to charge based on assets. Um, not performance. And then with um, it turned out that if you created a limited partnership rather than a mutual fund and you limited yourself to under 100 investors and um, you didn't raise, you didn't actively solicit money, didn't you know run ads, didn't have a, a sales force, although that, that, that distinction got a little, uh, a little iffy after a while, like you basically could do whatever you wanted. Like if you, if you thought something would make you money, you could do it. And that was fine. And um, there's like, there were little examples of this in history. Um, ben Graham, father of value investing, actually had such a fund. I think there was like Graham Newman was like a closed end fund that you could buy shares in. And then Newman Graham was like a hedge fund and it was like more leverage and there was some short selling, but it was otherwise similar strategies. But um, Alfred Winslow Jones was the guy who really pioneered the model. He was a journalist and sociologist and um, just kind of weird, like, one of those, one of the, the part of the last gasp of the wasp elite, like just doing doing interesting things and writing books and having lots of similarly upper crust friends. And um, he eventually figured out this. This I think he was like I think he did a freelance article for Fortune on different stock market prediction techniques and decided that all of them were stupid and that if he were to invest in the stock market, all of his competitors would be so dumb that even if he didn't really know what he was doing, he'd be able to outsmart them. And um, that's more or less what he did. Uh, like if you read about that fund, there's a lot, like they, they basically created something very similar to the modern pot structure. So he would have individual analysts who would cover a particular sector. He would try to be long and short stocks in the same sector. So instead of saying, GM is cheap, I'll buy GM. It was like, GM is cheap, so I will buy GM. I will also short forward that way if auto sales in general decline, I'm hedged and um, I'll make money either way as long as I'm right. Um, so that stuff is still a decent chunk of the, the hedge fund model. Um, other stuff he did is uh, not, not part of the model. Like um, he would get a lot of pitches from researchers who were publishing investment research and um, his firm would just uh, pay them bonuses if they gave him really good research. And obviously one way for them to do that would be give him the research first and then publish it. And, um, you know, if if a uh, stock gets upgraded and then it goes up, well, if he knew that that upgrade was coming, then he makes some easy money really fast. So um, did some things that were, were extremely aggressive and um, now completely illegal. But other things were like, just generally a sensible part of the model that you you charge based on performance, you try to hedge your exposure so you're not uh, not just betting the market goes up, but you're trying to differentiate among different companies and try to figure out what makes each company unique. And also um, not just understanding the business, but also understanding what makes the stock move. Why does it trade where it trades? A bunch of other hedge funds started appearing in the 60s and then in the early 70s, almost all of them went under. A lot of them were just, they realized they could borrow and stocks were going up. So they borrowed a lot to buy a lot and that worked really well for a while. And then most of them got wiped out, but there were a few survivors. And then um, you had this golden age in the 80s where you had people like Soros doing more macro stuff. Um, you had people like Tiger doing more um, more company specific fundamental stuff. And then quants, like computers started getting faster. We started having more data. So there were also people coming up with systematic strategies across different asset classes. A lot happened between 80s and today, but I'd say like the the current evolution has been um, towards like uh, there are some funds that run um, kind of the the classic strategies like just doing value based stock picking and 
being mostly long and having a couple short positions here and there. But um, the strategy that's gaining a lot of market share in terms of assets and a lot of mind share in terms of um, just public attention is the multi-strategy or multi-manager or platform or pod shop model, which is you um, you give a portfolio manager some capital budget slash risk budget. You tell them you are picking stocks. Here is your sector. Here are the kinds of companies you pick. Um, you must have no net exposure to the market. You must have no net exposure to large stocks versus small stocks or to one industry versus another industry or to momentum stocks versus value stocks. Once you, once you hedge out all of those factors, all of those things that cause different companies to correlate, then what you end up with is this very, very pure view of which stock is going up relative to its peers. That model has worked really well as a way to create these uncorrelated streams of alpha. So if you have 100 different people doing that in 100 different subsets of the market, and they all know what they're doing and stay on top of these companies better than anyone has ever stayed on top of any topic in human history ever before, um, they will generally figure out like when, you know, when are NVIDIA orders slightly slowing down or when are they perking up or when is this airline going to slightly accelerate its growth or when is this price war between these two steel companies going to finally abate or whatever. If you are continuously tracking that stuff and continuously turning over a portfolio, you end up always identifying the idiosyncratic news that's going to drive a given stock's movements. Um, beyond just the random noise that drives prices all the time. I know there's much more to say on this model. That's a general overview of, of what those funds do and how they think. Yeah, I think what, one thing I would, I would add is when you think about hedge funds and ventures like a product, right? They are selling something to LPs. And if you think about the vast majority of LPs, um, they're not looking for the most part for extreme returns and extreme risk, right? They're looking to balance a um, and exposure to uh, whatever their liabilities are, be it if you're a pension fund or endowment fund or sovereign wealth fund. Um, and so you are looking for something where you could basically say, I need to pay my pensioners every single year. Um, I don't have to pay them 20% of the assets that I have, but I can pay them maybe 6% of the assets, 4% of the assets that I have. Um, and consistency is really the key here. And I don't want to just be exposed to a strategy that could be up 40% one year and down 40% the next year. I want to be exposed to something that can consistently churn it out regardless of what's going on in the bond markets and the stock markets and the macro markets and the FX markets and so on. So I think that's what makes some of these hedge fund strategies so appealing because they're not selling you the idea that they can't make a lot of money. They're not selling you the idea that, you know, they can seed invest in a next Facebook um, or find the next SpaceX, right? That's not the idea. The idea is I can consistently, regardless of market, um, and interest rate conditions generate the type of returns that you need. And if that is a fit for your liability schedule, um, then I have product market fit. So if I were to give you some different strategies among the best venture capitalists, capital firms, and I'm going to ask you to do the same thing in, in the hedge fund um, world, but just to give an example, like Y Combinator, you know, sort of pioneered this, this accelerator model where they get special economics in uh, high volume uh, of companies every year, hundreds, if not a thousand companies every year at the earliest stages. They take a lot of uh, company risks, but they, they're, what their hope is they have a Coinbase, you know, every, uh, every batch. And that, you know, is uh, more than pays for, for the entire um, sort of batch size, probably, you know, is a 10x fund. And then they've done, they've done phenomenally well, whereas Benchmark focuses on having, uh, you know, consistent 400, 500 million dollar funds that lead uh, series A um, and, um, you know, and, and beyond um, and is focused on sort of, hey, we're going to do a small subset of, of companies, every sector and be super concentrated um, and try to be the best series A firm. Whereas someone like 8VC and Joe Lonsdale, they, they, they're, you know, much bigger AUM. Uh, and they're all stages. They also do incubations and their superpower is focusing on regulated industries um, and using their relationships with uh, with government uh, as you know, because of Palantir and and Andrew and others to and, you know, Founders Fund does something similar. So I just say that as an example of to name a couple of or a few top firms and kind of different spikes or different strategies that they deploy. Can you guys do the same thing for the for the hedge fund world? Yeah. So like we've mentioned the multi, multi-manager, multi-strategy funds, and the annoying thing about them is like they, they encompass a large number of different strategies um, within them. So 
we've talked about the, the fundamentals, driven strategies, but a lot of those funds, um, they'll also have systematic strategies. And those range from kind of broad scale strategies, like let's find, um, let's look at all the different asset prices. Let's look at what correlates with what, and either, either A, we have some view that these correlations, um, if something diverges from its correlation, it's going to snap right back. So, you know, if the oil stocks all move together most of the time and they all move with the price of oil and then one stock is lagging, like that's the one you buy and you short a basket of other stocks against it. Um, and then you can you can get into much more sophisticated systematic strategies. There's one category that goes through booms and busts and went through such a cycle recently, which is um, index inclusion strategies. So this is when you try to predict who will get added to or removed from the S&P 500 or other indices. And then um, like the first order problem is just predicting who gets added or removed based on index explicit index inclusion criteria and just your view of what the debate would be like when the index committee is meeting and saying, do we really want to add this company? Do we really want to kick this one out? Um, but you're also trying to bet on what is the volume of trades that is already making this bet. So um, if the if index inclusion means that the index funds have to buy 10 million shares of company X, but um, the traders betting on that index inclusion have already bought 15 million anticipating selling them to the index, then it's actually a bad catalyst. Like it's it's bad news when the in index inclusion actually happens. Uh, they are trying to sell more stock than, uh, than the index funds want to buy. So you can have things like that. Um, another style that also goes in and out of fashion is global macro, but really you can split global, global macro into two things. Um, one of which, would, and there are two things with opposite cycles. So one of them is doing these global relative value trades where you look at the world and you basically look at which countries seem to be converging in terms of standard of living and in terms of like government norms with the United States and you buy their currencies or you buy their assets. Um, and then you um, basically expect that conversion, that convergence to continue. And then the other one is you look at the state of the world, you decide, something is totally unsustainable, something's going to break, and I'm going to figure out what's going to break, and I'm going to bet that it breaks. Um, I'm going to find the most cost-effective way to bet that it breaks. And um, that that kind of thing can work extremely well when there is a crisis, or sometimes it works well when there is a crisis in one place, or when there's some outlier event. Like, Hey, everybody. Eric here with a word from our sponsors. The Riff is sponsored by my longtime partner, SecureFrame, the only compliance automation platform with AI capabilities that helps customers speed up cloud remediation and security questionnaires. One of the things I love about SecureFrame is that it takes this time-consuming process that every company has to do in order to unlock revenue from other companies and makes it easy and simple. SecureFrame empowers businesses to build trust with customers by simplifying information, security, and compliance through AI, not wasteful human hours, by automating manual tasks related to security risk and compliance. SecureFrame allows companies to focus on growing their business. Thousands of fast-growing businesses use SecureFrame, including AngelList, Ramp, and Coda to expedite their compliance journey. I believe in them so much, I invested in them. If there is an acronym that your company dreads, SecureFrame can help. Sign up for a free demo at secureframe.com slash riff, and mention the riff during your demo to get 20% off your first year of SecureFrame. Basically, every time, every time there's an election surprise, um, you wait a couple weeks and you'll find out that some macro hedge fund is now up like 300% because they had a massively levered bet on Argentinian stocks or something. And they were just the only ones who believed it would really happen and, and the rally would be uh, as, as magnificent as it was. Um, there was similar stuff around, um, around Brexit where hedge funds were commissioning private polling and trying to track the developments of Brexit over time and trying to predict would it happen and if so, what is the magnitude of the price impact? Um, so that's that's the broad overview of the macro style. There are definitely these benchmark style, highly concentrated long term funds. Um, some of them, they are trying to invest in companies that have serious problems and help them work through those problems. Um, sometimes that's like gently helping them, giving them advice. Sometimes that's like we're going to work through these problems by firing everyone responsible and putting in a new CEO. Um, it has been, I think, tougher to run funds like that for a while, in part because the performance is really lumpy. Like if your portfolio is five stocks and um, they're all pretty volatile, like your portfolio is going to be, it's going to really bounce around. And the other problem is if it's five stocks and you hold them an average of three years, it's pretty easy for people to ride on your coattails and just own the same thing you own in the same proportion and get, get roughly the same returns without the fees. Um, other strategies... Um, some funds do focus entirely on short selling, but that one is really, really hard to get right as a fund. Um, the problem, part of the problem is like, 
the time when you want to be selling a lot of stocks short is when there are a ton of garbage companies that are going public and a ton of companies that should be dead, but they're still somehow alive. But that's also a time when short sellers are all losing money because uh, like the first like Wirecard collapsed a couple of years ago. It was the German fintech um, that people thought the scandal was they're doing payment processing for porn and the scandal was they're doing payment processing for nobody. They're, uh, it was mostly fake. Um, but the first short seller to write about them was writing about them in like 2008, I think. And was writing like, these margins are too high. It doesn't make sense. I think this company's fraud. Um, so you can lose a lot of money by being right, but early. And then if you're managing money every year, your investors look at your returns. They say, market's up, you're down. You're actually down more than the market because you're shorting the worst companies and those do the best when the market's doing really well. So we're going to pull some money out. So you end up with a fund where like, they were managing a billion 10 years ago. And then at the time when they have more opportunities than they can count, they're down to like 50 million. And the founder's really only doing it because he's uh, insane or <laughs> just hates, hates the companies he's short and needs to see them all die before he retires. Yeah, I, I think to, to double click on a couple of things, to, um, for companies, for, for funds that like to be active, um, a lot of these guys tend to actually also be distressed funds uh, because in a distressed situation, you actually get to invest participate in the financial restructuring of the business. And it will be very difficult for someone else to ride onto your coattails because you only have typically a couple of the distressed investors um, in that space. Uh, you have some from some of the best uh, returning hedge funds of all time actually just do this for the most part, right? The idea is, you know, a company is about to be bankrupt. Um, do you purchase uh, the security? For the most part, you're purchasing the security that gets converted into equity. Um, and so when a company emerges from bankruptcy um, in that entire process, you are converting the bonds uh, that you've purchased or the loans that you've purchased. It becomes the uh, the anchor equity uh, when a company comes out again and becomes uh, a public company. And that's where you can exit as a, as a large uh, shareholder. Um, this is really no different from like what a venture fund will do with a very large ownership stake in, let's say, like a Series B or Series C led round. Just that in this case, the round was... Um, catalyzed by a Chapter 11 filing versus like a Series B thing uh, report. Um, and one one other big strategy out there, um, it's a little bit more on the, on the blend of macro and, um, and quant strategy is this concept called risk arbitrage or uh, risk parity, um, famously um, made, made, made huge by uh, Bridgewater. Um, and risk parity is this neat little idea where you are balancing a portfolio of uh, call it equity and fixed income, right? And anytime you're shifting equity and fixed income. And I think the fundamental premise uh, underneath that is equity and fixed income are not well correlated. Um, it's debatable whether that's true, but it's generally not well correlated. Um, and you have very different return profiles between equity and fixed income. And the idea is with the right blend between equity and fixed income, you can, you can relatively precisely determine the expected returns of the fund. And as a result, the expected risk of the fund. So when you go out and you um, and you try to target a particular return, again, not every investor needs you to make 20%. Some investors come to you and say, I just need 9.5%. You can actually tune a risk parity fund to just specifically target 9.5% expected return. And if the investor says, look, I'm comfortable with this amount of risk that you're taking, uh, that I'm being exposed to, then you have a product. Uh, so that's that's a pretty well-established um, a part part of uh, the hedge fund space too. Yeah, and it does it does end up being a macro bet because if you if you look at a really long chart of the equity and fixed income correlation, what you see is that the sign flips depending on how high inflation is and like how I guess how uncertain inflation is. So like um, when I when I started working at a hedge fund in 2012, um, it was just this fact of life that stocks when stocks go down, treasury bonds go up, and vice versa. But if you look back, that basically became true in 1998 because there was this um, market dip because of long-term capital management, because of the East Asian financial crisis and the Russian crisis and all this stuff. And um, the Fed dramatically increased liquidity and it um, really pushed up the price of bonds. And um, that eventually stocks snapped back, bonds came back down. That's where the liquidity ultimately went, was into the stock market. And um, then you got 1999 and part of 2000, which was really fun for everybody. Um, <laughs> for a while, except, except those short sellers, unfortunately. Um, but that, um, that was possible because inflation had been on this gentle decline from the early eighties onward. And we'd kind of, we'd, I, I don't know if the fed explicitly was talking about this, but 1998 would have been about the point at which you could say 
China's labor supply is effectively infinite given the world's demand for just physical goods. And um, so pretty much as long as as long as that's true, as long as people can leave the countryside, move to the cities and start making stuff, um, the cost of tradable physical goods, TVs, toys, furniture, apparel, like all of that is going to be um, either flat or declining. Like it's crazy how much the prices of some of these products have declined. And a lot of it is that production moved from countries that were expensive to countries that were cheap. And China had this combination of a huge labor force and um, lots of uh, lots of good ports, lots of coastal cities with manufacturing and um, definitely like, government willingness to to um, grow the industrial base and to invest more in infrastructure. So, um, yeah, there was a long period where inflation, you just did not have to worry about inflation. And so anytime growth slowed down, stocks would drop, rates would drop. So bonds would go up. And so risk parity was a fantastic trait then. But it turned out like risk parity does turn out to be this macro bet that inflation will stay low. And therefore, the risk adjusted return of stocks plus bonds is way better than the risk adjusted return of either one. Actually, I would I would push that idea a little bit, Bern, and argue that most strategies, like forget hedge funds, private equity, but most investment strategies is fundamentally a bet on the shape of the yield curve. You think so? If you're a for VC, you are long the tail end of the yield curve, right? You want the tail end of the yield curve to be as low as possible. If you are risk parity, you basically want the uh, the yield curve to, I guess, be rel- relatively curve shaped, right? That's basically what you want, right? To look like what people would think of a yield curve when they draw it, draw it out. If you are a um, if you are a hedge fund, like a market neutral, factor neutral hedge fund, you would like the short end of the yield curve to be high, the yield curve to be flat or almost inverted, which would reflect super high volatility. So it, it almost it almost is like everyone is just on a macro level, just batting on the shape of the yield curve to some degree. I think that's true. Don't don't tell the VCs, but it, it's true. Like so so like a flat low yield curve implies a very low growth environment where real rates are extremely low. And that means that if you can actually invest in a company that can produce secular growth at a time when rates are low, like the valuation just goes completely nonlinear. Like if you look at what companies were trading at in 2021, it was because the present value of profits in 10 years was really close to the the value of those profits today. And uh, so a lot of them could get valued on, um, you know, a multiple of like 2027's revenue or something. And as long as they were growing really fast, like that multiple actually made them look quite cheap. And um, so, yeah, they those things work really, really well when rates are extremely low. Low rates also mean there's a lot of capital floating around. And since a lot of like back to that earlier point on what the LPs want, like they want often a single digit return. Now, if um, if you can buy 10 year treasuries at 5 percent, a single digit return is really not hard to get just buying very simple assets. But if your treasuries are earning 70 basis points um, instead, then you absolutely have to take risk to do that. And then you end up with this really interesting feedback loop where there's a lot of money flowing into the growthiest parts of the economy and um, a lot of startups sell things to other startups. So like every time another large check goes into snowflake before its ipo suddenly there are more more zoom and docusign seats being sold and more slack seats being sold and you know, there's more usage on aws so it's all feeding into the same ecosystem and if everything's trading at a high enough price to sales ratio then basically every dollar that goes into the ecosystem actually increases the market value of that ecosystem by more than that dollar and then if companies are also paying people um increasingly in equity then um there, you don't need that much cash to keep the flywheel going for a really long time. So, um, yeah, I, I do think that uh, venture did turn out, at least modern venture, where you have an ecosystem of startups, they're selling to other startups, where people understand unit economics well enough to look at a company that's burning cash now and ask, okay, what are they getting when they burn that cash? Like, how much LTV are they getting for the CAC that they have to spend? And if that number looks good, then yeah, you could put a really high valuation in these companies. Like that's, I think that's one of the things that just changed in the venture ecosystem, even, even over like the five years through 2021 is just people got really, really good at quickly identifying companies that have product market fit, looking at what the unit economics look like and discounting that, like looking at the TAM and then basically saying someone else can also figure out these numbers. And so someone else can grab this TAM. So we absolutely need to give this company massive funding. And then the playbook for growing a company really, really fast by dumping a lot of money into it, that playbook got very refined by that time. Like you could find someone who had also worked at a company that scale at that kind of speed and who knew what the bottlenecks were. Um, meanwhile, some of the scaling uh, got easier because of all of these third-party services. So like 
you didn't have to build out an entire internal communications infrastructure or like, you know, Amazon had, um, when they were getting started, they apparently built their entire customer service system in Emacs Lisp. And um, so they had to build it and they built it in the language that some of their engineers knew. But now, yeah, you would just use front or something. And so you don't have to put any engineer hours into building that system, which means you could scale that much faster. So like more of the money went more, I guess more of the management attention went directly into the company's core competency because everything that was non-core was somebody else's SaaS product you could just buy and plug it in. So you mentioned don't tell the VCs uh, the, the line about the yield curve. Um, why is that? Because it, it implies that more is out of their control than they'd like to think or more is macro than they'd like to think or, 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 or say more. I mean, it's, it's half that and half like I don't want to hear about someone losing 80 percent of their net worth because they bought steepeners or did some kind of weird esoteric trade that occupied way more of their attention than it's worth. Like, I think everyone everyone should just be aware, like you're making macro bets all the time unless you're explicitly thinking about what how does the macro situation affect you and how could you hedge that and even if you do like it's impossible to be fully honest with yourself about how much of your own career is the result of luck and how much is skill and how much is effort and how much is whatever else you want to throw to the mix like it's just really hard to really hard to admit that especially if you just made a lot of money and you feel like you're a genius like doing the principal component analysis and being like well it's a uh, 20 percent genius it's 80 percent um you know a low growth environment that happened to be very favorable for the career that I got into for unrelated reasons. Like that's just a tough one. And of course, when you do, if you hedge that kind of exposure, it also means that you are always making less money at the peak, which is also when your particular money making skill is the most salient. Like the more you hedge, the less you make when things do well, that's the nature of hedging. And so it sort of means that um, if you get, you know, this glowing, like instead of getting a really glowing profile of what a genius you are, you get this profile. It's like, this guy is like the other VCs. In fact, he would be among the best of the VCs, except that he did this esoteric interest rate hedge because of some weird theory about how VC is actually a bet on flat yield curves. Um, yeah, so it's a... Uh, it, 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 it's it's tough to know exactly what to do with that information. You can theoretically hedge, but uh, it may may not turn out well. It's interesting because if you ask VCs about how they think about macro, they'll say they don't think about it that much, right? They'll, they'll say, hey, great companies were started in 001, they were started in 08, they, they were started, you know, the great companies are started every year and they can't find, a, a, you know, trends that say that more great companies are started one year th 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 than the other. And often, you know, um, like right before the bubble hits is when people make the most money, uh, they'll say. And so... Uh, they'll say, "Hey, we can't. We're just going to invest the same amount every year." Although you've other, you know, founders fund did cut their fund size in half, so they're implicitly saying, "Hey, now is not the right time to be deploying that much capital." Some some firms do change their fund size accordingly, but you know, many will say that they don't think about macro at all. Yeah, but it comes down it comes down to um, when you're betting on a company, you're actually betting on two things, right? You're betting on the fundamental performance of the business, and you're also betting on the discount rate to discount the future cash flows of the business. So I think um, it, it's totally fair to say good companies are started any year, good markets, bad markets, it doesn't matter. Uh, but ultimately, you know, 50% or more than 50% of the value of any business gets accrued by the discount rate. So, you know, say differently, I'm a founder myself. If you told me tomorrow, the Fed is going to cut interest rates to zero and a big end here, the interest, the 30 year rates are going to go down to like 0 0.25. Um, my value of my business is simply going to go through the moon without me doing anything. The business performance does not need to change for me to look like a genius and for my investors to look like geniuses, even though realistically we did nothing, right? Like nothing has changed. So I think fundamentally for a lot of VCs, that has to be the bet that you you are making because A, you're not shorting, you're not really hedging out a lot of risk. And B, you know, at the end of the day, you are you have to be exposed to this and you just have to pick your spot where, um, you either invest in a time where the rates environments are favorable for yourself, like today, right? You could argue that rates are relatively high um, to average today. Um, and you try to reduce the amount that you're doing when rates are low. Uh, but as Byrne pointed out, the problem with doing that, the problem with trying to be smart around, you know, the stuff that you're betting on that you're not supposed to be betting on is when markets are really good, you don't look as smart as everybody else because the measure of success in the investment industry tends to be returns, not risk-adjusted returns.
There's also like, if you spend too much time thinking about the macro stuff, like, can you imagine that you, you know, you pass on the company that turns out to be the next meta or Uber or something because you were worried about what the Fed said at the last meeting? Like, that is like, A, you know, that would be humiliating. But B, it's, um, it's just not your comparative advantage. Like, if you're, if you're actually good at predicting where interest rates go, you shouldn't be investing in early stage companies. You should be trading interest rate futures. You'll do very well. Um, it's, a, it's a huge, extremely liquid market, but um, it's hard to predict. So it's more like it adds, it adds this layer of risk to the outcome that is, um, in practical terms, hard to hedge. And, um, but also the way that VCs, like to this absolute return point, the way that VCs think about their returns, they, they're almost, as far as I know, they don't calculate a sharp ratio or anything. Like, Nobody, nobody is looking at, um, I don't know, the benchmark fund that backed Uber and being like, well, you know, they did incredibly well and returned the fund many times over with that, that one investment. On the other hand, there was a lot of volatility along the way. So really not so hot. Like, no, no, nobody excludes, no, nobody adjusts for that. Um, in part, you can't do anything with it. Um, and also the volatility doesn't matter if you, um, if you have a defined fund life and you can't, you're not using leverage, so you can't get margin called. So the volatility over the life of the fund doesn't matter that much if you can't actually access the money anyway. It matters on this sort of theoretical basis. It matters if you are um, not marking stuff down during downturns as much as you should. And so you're risk adjusted. Like if you do get compared on a risk adjusted basis, your numbers are artificially good. But I think it's really, it's on the LPs, I think, to, to consider just how different entities report their numbers, how they think about their numbers, what they're actually optimizing for. Because yeah, if you if you want to go for maximum risk adjusted returns, you do just you put money into a multi strategy fund and you get good risk adjusted returns, but the returns in absolute terms are not that high. If you want to maximize absolute returns, you accept the fact that you're you're investing in venture funds, they have relatively concentrated portfolios. Um, those portfolios get more concentrated the better they do. So they're um, the risk adjusted side to the extent that that matters gets more and more salient, like a fund that, you know, the benchmark fund that invested in Uber, like the day-to-day -day variance in the value of that fund, if they were marking it to market day-to-day -day, would be entirely Uber, like nothing else would matter. It wouldn't even be worth calculating anything else. So um, it does become extremely skewed by that, but um, it is itself part of a larger portfolio that probably does have good risk adjusted returns or you know, hopefully has good risk adjusted returns in part because it got a big chunk of returns from that and in part because other things are buffering the risk. Yeah, I mean, a, a big part of what makes an LP an LP is, you know, you don't want your GPs to be focused on things that they're not good at. You want them to be focused on things that they are good at. And you have the opportunity to allocate your capital across GPs to hedge on some of these returns. Right. You can find a macro fund who's particularly good at performing uh, when interest rates are going up. And then you can basically use that as a hedge uh, for for uh, some of these like venture bets. Like one a fund that recently shuttered um, and has one of the longest track records of being a short only fund, Kinecos Associates. Uh, like their famous pitch out there was they would actually tell LPs, look, ultimately, you don't invest in me to try to make absolute dollars. Like that is not the point. I am a short only fund. There will be years where even if I absolutely do my best job and I do and my best job is reflected in the markets, we are still down on an absolute basis. But I am your beta hedge. Right. Think about all of the investments in the world that you're making. That is a positive beta bet. Um, and you want to reduce beta. Then use me. I'm the smartest beta bet, uh, beta hedge you can have. Because I'm not just shorting the S&P 500. I'm actually shorting businesses that could go down even when the market is going up. Right. So it is the onus is also on the LPs to do that. We have seen that shift recently right, with these multi-strategy funds where they're saying we will take care of all of that consideration for you. One check to us is the same as you doing all these portfolio allocation work on your back end. Um, and you don't have to worry about any of these problems anymore. Um, you just have to cut that check and I'll take care of the entirety of the risk model for you too. So I wrote a piece actually on on shorting recently and how it's become a worse and worse hedge over time. And um, like the basic argument was when people are shorting, whether it's on an you know unconstrained generalist basis or within an industry, like they tend to find the same companies and they tend to say like, these are the companies that are over earning or these are the companies whose CEO is lying and or these are the companies that are really promotional and so we're, we're going to be short them by default. Or at the other end, they do the, um, the funding short of just 
this is a company where nothing is going to change over the next decade. So if we have to have a short position, we could just short this and not, not think about it anymore. But one problem with that is that that means when there are extreme market disruptions and when the hedge funds are telling all their portfolio managers, like cut your exposure in half as quickly as possible, then they're all buying, like they're all um, selling the same stuff or, you know, more likely than not selling some of the same stuff and also more likely than not buying some of the same stuff. Um, and sometimes it's gratifying sometimes when I am on Twitter and I see a rumor that some pod somewhere blew up and then I look at the stocks that I'm short and see they're all up five or 10%. Like it feels, it feels good to know that I'm, I'm shorting the same things that the professionals are, even if, this, even if I found out because that particular professional didn't perform well, got fired. Um, and actually one of the interesting examples of this I stumbled on recently was um, there's this company called Zion Oil and Gas, which is a scam, um, basically. I, I mean, I'm not sure for sure, but they're they're drilling for oil in Israel, which is like, it is one industry that Israel does not excel in. And Israel is like the one part of the Middle East where that's not like the main thing you should do as a source of economic activity. But um, they like raising money from American investors who just think this is, this is really cool. And, you know, maybe it's biblical somehow, whatever. Um, the stock stock in Zion Oil and Gas, it was at $6 a share in December 2008, and then went up to um, $14 a share in February 2009. So it's got to be one of the better performing U.S. equities over that time period. This is like the depths of the crisis. And I have to assume that a lot of it was that very smart people were shorting this. They said this is a retail promotion. It's going to run out of money and die. And then all of them were losing money on everything else they did and had to cut exposure and had to buy back. And so stock went up. I mean, maybe they did a big promotion then. Maybe maybe they had some sort of you know financial crisis themed, end of times themed uh, stock promotion. But um, like a lot of the, the worst companies in the world all go up on bad days because everyone is covering. So it becomes harder. Like over over longer periods, definitely shorts do head to portfolio. But like day to day, it's uh, it's more painful. Are everyday investors competing with hedge funds in any meaningful sense? W why don't you say more about this? Yeah, I, in many ways, no, because everyday investors will generally, either you have a really short time frame and you're more or less gambling or, or you know, making, making educated bets on just little minor market movements that you think will continue or reverse or whatever, or you're making these longer term bets that are more like, I know this company, I like the company, like I use the products all the time, I'm going to buy the stock and hold it for 20 years. And if you're doing that, it really doesn't matter if uh, if Citadel is better informed than you are about how this quarter is shaping up. Like, yeah, it stinks that maybe you would have bought the stock for 10 percent less if you waited a week until they reported bad earnings. But if you actually believe in the company, then um, it's it's a minor difference, especially over longer time scales. And if you're investing continuously, like you're saving money, you're putting a little money into the market every so often, then um, it does it does all average out. And one of the nice things that it means, um, one of the nice effects that it has for for you as an investor, all these hedge funds, is that they are pricing in all the incremental changes in the outlook, like all the time. So every time there's a new round of data that tells you a little bit about share shift within some industry, the hedge funds are immediately adjusting to that or they've predicted it and already adjusted. So you're actually less likely to get blindsided by some kinds of surprises. Um, that's especially true on the revenue side of consumer facing companies because it's uh, for various reasons much easier to track the data on consumer spending that way but it's i think broadly true that hedge funds do make the market more efficient and so you're you're getting a better deal but hedge funds are not uh they're not trying to figure out where the stock will trade in 10 years they're trying to figure out um, to the extent that they are it's more like they're trying to reverse engineer the process of large, long only investors, so Fidelity, Capital Group, et cetera, trying to figure out where they think the stock will be in 10 years and what um, what incremental news flow over the next two weeks is going to adjust their 10 year price target in a predictable way that you can trade ahead of. I think the single largest source of advantage in the markets, um, ironically, are not owned by hedge funds, are owned by retail investors, and that's time horizon. So over a long enough time horizon, you can actually outperform um, most hedge funds, uh, if you do things um, with discipline, because hedge funds have have some disadvantages, which you generally can avoid relatively easily as a as a, fund, uh, re a retail investor. The first disadvantage is that hedge funds incur a lot of short term capital uh, gains tax when they when they make money because of trades that 
for the most part, don't go above a year. It's pretty rare for hedge funds to take bad stat over a year. Um, and for retail, you know, holding a stock for over a year is really not that difficult, right? There, there's rarely a need to be trafficking in these stocks that much. And the second key benefit is hedge funds need to show short-term performance, right? Monthly returns do matter. Quarter, quarterly returns absolutely matter. And so they are forced to take movements um, where the markets are not favorable. So for instance, this grossing down problem, you know, if the markets are bad and everybody's losing money, that's actually the time where you want to be deploying capital, right? That's the time where good companies are cheap and bad companies are expensive. But typically what people are doing is they're reducing their exposure to the market to figure out what is going on. And that's the point where you see huge market dislocations, business, you know, large trillion dollar companies are down 7%, 8% on, on seemingly no news. Um, you have you have those big events happening. And as a retail investor, you can sit there and say, 8% is nothing if I'm going to hold this stock for the next like 10 years, right? Whatever, I'll just hang on to it. And that time horizon delta is a huge source of alpha in a market um, that for the most part is not competed away uh, even even with hedge, uh, the biggest hedge funds, because they don't have the ability to do that. Yeah, like the hedge funds, they're measuring themselves on a risk adjusted basis. And part of it is just how they're, how they're structured and how they're capitalized. So um, they're, they're often levered, like I think six to eight, six or eight to one is about the usual ratio. And so if you're an individual portfolio manager at one of those funds, if you have like a billion dollar allocation, like normally if you think of, okay, this person is managing a billion dollars and they're investing in the stock market, you'd think their target return is like 10% a year. But no, their target gross return is on the order of like two or 3% a year, like 3%. If you could do 3% regularly, that's actually pretty extraordinary. Um, and if you think of that 3% as like a 30 million a year stream of income, like obviously there's there's enough money there to pay for for office supplies and salaries and things like that. You can, you can have a nice living on that. But um, because they are hedging so many things out, like they just aren't taking enough risk to make massive returns. The risk comes from like the, the massive returns come from stacking a bunch of these portfolios together. So you have like a billion dollar capital base. So you have six of these portfolios, although it's really more like you have a $20 billion capital base. And so you have like a hundred or 200 of these portfolios. They're all huge portfolios and they're all grinding out these returns and, you know, subtract off all of the costs for paying the paying your employees and paying the bonuses and for all of the the data you're buying all the infrastructure you build and um and often like the the investors are getting um like the the lps are getting like 50 percent or so maybe 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 two-thirds but often like half of the gross return but they are getting this um very steady return doesn't really correlate with anything and um it's all from from a bunch of people trying to grind out that that low single digit return and if you're trying to do that and if you have a mandate where when you lose x amount you're you lose half your capital if you lose another x amount you're fired where in both cases x is like a single digit percentage number um then you're going to be really really cautious and if you make a trade and it's not working right away you're probably going to exit that trade because you don't know if you don't know why it's not working and obviously if you knew why it wasn't working you wouldn't have done it in the first place like um you don't know how much you can lose and so it means that they the hedge funds are in this constant constant effort to generate new ideas um, there's this idea of idea velocity like if you have a portfolio and it has X amount of names and you're turning over all of the stocks in that portfolio every Y trading days, then you can quickly get to a number that's like, I need at least one original long or short idea every workday, roughly, to, to have a portfolio that has the right structure and where I'm, I'm trading on fresh enough ideas that everyone will be happy. And um, so the median quality of the ideas is not necessarily good, but it is a volume game. And it also means that sometimes if you if you found a bunch of really compelling long ideas um, and so your your book is now tilting towards net long, now you have to go find some short ideas and you sort of have to invent some reason to hate a company that is kind of nondescript, not that interesting. And you actually have to put a lot of effort into engineering a short thesis where there is nothing, nothing reasonable about shorting this company. And similarly, you have to put a lot of effort into, like if you happen to be in a portfolio or in a, in a sector where valuations are really, really high and stocks have done really well, like if you are the SaaS analyst and it's Q4 of 2021, um, inventing a reason to think that this company trading at 80 times sales is actually really cheap and therefore I need to buy it to offset all of my shorts at 85 times sales. Like, um, you actually have to put a lot of effort into coming up with those. Whereas if you're just a normal everyday investor, sometimes you just look at stocks in a particular category and you're like, 
there is no reason I would ever own any of these, or I would never short any of these. They're just astonishingly cheap. And um, you can, you know, if you're an individual investor and you decide that today I am going to put 70% of my money into banks and next week or next year, it's like 80% into media companies, like no one tells you no. Um, but in a, at a hedge fund, you, you definitely have constraints on what you can invest in. And then the trade-off there is like, you do learn the industries really, really well. And you learn what drives all the stocks and you learn which management teams you can trust and which ones you can't and who understands their business and who doesn't. And you learn what, um, what the early indicators of some change might be. So you do get a really, really deep, but very narrow view of a particular slice of the economy, which is nice. The we, we talked about a number of things, things that these firms do and di different strategies that, that the funds do. What are what, what don't these funds do or, or what, what should they do differently? That's a, that's a broad question because um, there's there's a lot of different types of funds. Um, but I think but I think one of the things that a, a lot of hedge funds always ask themselves is um, what is the business of a hedge fund fundamentally? Right. And fundamentally, if you really think about a lot of hedge funds, they're set up as quote unquote hedge funds. Right. Um, fundamentally, you're trying you're in the risk removal game. Right? You're trying to remove as much risk as possible because you have access to cheap enough leverage that if you can consistent, like Bernie said, a three percent consistent return is world class. It's absolutely phenomenal because if you can guarantee that, you can go out and borrow ten times on the money and make thirty percent return. Right? That's loosely speaking the math that you can you can run. So the the uh, in order to get to a consistent 3%, the key being consistent, you are removing every type of risk possible. Uh, but the challenge with doing that is you end up being in a lot of situations with a lot of other funds who are trying to do the exact same thing. So hedge funds tend to get into these concepts called crowded longs and crowded shorts, where you look at a particular name and everyone needs to short it because everyone has the same long thesis. Everyone wants to go you know, along Amazon this quarter and short out a bunch of other, you know, e-commerce tech names for whatever reason, where everyone wants to long booking and short out the rest of travel. And it, you get into this really, uh, really uh, nuanced situations where if the company reports earnings that, so let's say everyone is long Amazon and you expect Amazon to beat earnings and Amazon does beat earnings, but not by enough because of how much people are long Amazon, all of a sudden the stock is trading down because these guys who are long Amazon basically now have to sell. Or like they are in this position where, well, what is next? There is nothing next. The company has told us it is not doing as well as everybody thought. The bar was really, really high. They didn't clear the bar. So now we have to sell and Amazon's down to beat earnings. Fundamentally, the company is doing more than fine. Um, and all these hedge funds that are supposed to be in the risk removal game actually just took on a bunch of risk and lost a bunch of money because the one risk that they did not remove was the risk that everybody else was removing the same risk. So it's a little bit meta, but it happens all the time. A lot of money is being lost in this game of everyone is trying to remove the same amount of risk. Um, the way you avoid that problem in a, in a weird way is to do stuff that other people are just not looking at, is to get involved in places where people are just not involved in. Um, but it also becomes harder because when you're in a place where others are not involved in, you get less resources, you have less people to talk to, you have less conferences to attend. Um, you are you are on an island on your own more often. And psychologically, it's a much more difficult battle to, to fight when you are constantly on that island. And when you work for a very, very large platform, you know, one of these like uh, double digit billion dollar shops, what you very quickly realize that you can't not deploy on a lever basis hundreds of billions of dollars in ideas that other people are not looking at, right? The equity markets will tap out very, very quickly uh, in those spaces. So you are the, the risk that you a lot of hedge funds end up ultimately taking that they really want to get out of is the risk that everybody else is doing the same thing. Yeah, like it's it's kind of the the curse of hedge fund managers is that they start out in that business because they really like picking stocks or building you know building systematic models or whatever or, or day trading and then um, they they grow to the point where that is zero percent of their job and one hundred percent of what they do is some combination of risk management, investor relations, or recruiting and. They, they end up building a system where they sort of, they automate a lot of the stuff that they're good at or they systematize a lot of the stuff they're good at. And then they they have to find their own idiosyncratic source of returns. So if you have built, um, you know, if your hedge fund has um, 
access to you know the best prime brokers like everyone else and has the best exchange connectivity like everyone else and has the best algorithms for um, implementing trades with low slippage etc cetera, etc cetera. um like you 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 have to get some kind of idiosyncratic return from hiring idiosyncratic people and you have to find them and find them early and get them on board and um and then like you know some of the business ends up actually being this business of like the trade that the hedge fund entity structures is how do we define this person's incentives and their non-compete and so on such that we capture as much of the alpha as we think they're capable of generating and we do so at an acceptable price like a lot of these funds they're offering experienced portfolio managers guaranteed bonuses and you know they're 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 agreeing to hire them at the beginning of a non-compete and then letting them wait out the non-compete and so on so they're actually um weirdly enough going back to the venture model of we found this talented person we're not perfectly sure what they're capable of, but they seem to know what they're doing and they have this opportunity that they have in mind. There's going to be a long lag between when we've made our decision and written our first check and when we actually see the returns, but we think the returns will be good. So um, weirdly enough, like from the LP perspective, a hedge fund is like the world's most marvelous treasury bond. It doesn't produce exactly the same coupon at exactly the right cadence, but it's way better than a treasury bond, way more stable, doesn't correlate with anything and very safe. But then from the GP perspective, it's actually a venture fund. You're actually looking for the handful of superstars who will actually do that, that 3% gross every single year that will actually make your business the, the best business it could be. And that is that is a really hard task. And it's one that um, the, the work that gets someone in a position where they can do it is not actually directly relevant. Like it's, it's hard to generalize the skill of investing well to the skill of choosing the right people. And kind of what's weird come to think of it is that the big platform funds, so you have 0.72, which has kind of a day trading heritage, um, Millennium also like a day trading, and I think options heritage, and then Citadel is like systematic fixed income background. Bali was equities day trading background. So like Actually, none of the platform shops come from this um, this background of we're going to meet management and really get to know them, see how firm the handshake is, ask ourselves, can we trust this person over long periods? Like that was that was a lot of what Tiger was trying to do is like assess people's integrity and figure out if they're good stewards of capital. Um, weirdly enough, that seems to not have translated into creating platform like multi strategy platform funds in the current model. There there is like more so was than is like this tiger ecosystem because tiger tiger management was um you know among the biggest funds and then they had a really bad run in the late 90s wound down but they kept the office lease julian robertson gave seed funding to a bunch of his best analysts and other people in his extended network and so there ended up being this sort of implicit multi-manager fund but they were all using very similar strategies there was a while where you if you searched sec filings for 101 park which is the tiger office like you find like the same set of growth companies that were in everybody's portfolio. Like everybody loved booking. Everybody loved Google. Um, I don't think they were big Microsoft people, but there were, there were a couple others where like everyone in that Netflix. Yes. They loved Netflix um, dearly. So like they, they were, um, they were doing the part where you have multiple managers who are running independent portfolios. They did not do the part where you have this central risk management team. That's like, looks like our exposure to, um, you know, high momentum stocks that are in streaming media is actually like eight standard deviations above where it should be. So we got to tail that, uh, you know, got to trim that a little bit. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe Julian was always buying puts on whatever stock the, uh, the tiger, fu- the tiger cup funds were all crowded into. Um, probably not, but it's funny to imagine is like a, it's like a hedge against the, uh, against like the necessary group think of having a bunch of really smart people who respect each other, all sharing notes. Um, but yeah, they, they ended up not doing that. So it's um it's kind of kind of a surprising paradox that this that the background that you would think would produce people who'd be really good at assessing portfolio managers and assessing analysts who might become portfolio managers, that did not actually translate into doing that, and that um, the people who did it just really love the game of trading. Well, when you guys uh, say more about the the peak pod thesis and uh, and and how 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 true true is it? Like at some point, or I guess if you look back, um, it used to be that whatever regressions you ran for just general like market exposures, if you plotted hedge fund, equity hedge fund returns against that, there was a really big gap. And starting around the year 2000, the gap started to shrink. And by around 2010, the gap was was pretty minimal. Um, 
and you know it was getting eerily close to like what the drag from fees plus taxes and things like that would be so like there there was a point when hedge funds were pretty much as a group generating lots of alpha and then some of that started going away and now we're at this weird point where actually probably the quality of the alpha that they report is a lot higher like there are way more funds that will tell you either we have no net market exposure and they're telling the truth or here is our exposure and here's what we did on top of that exposure um so the quality of the reported alpha is a lot higher but the quantity of alpha available just has to shrink if the the skill level of all the investors is going up and if they really really understand this model extremely well and basically have gotten it down to a science that they can generate x number of ideas and have a hit rate of whatever 53 percent or something and um as long as they're able to consistently do that, like they will make money and it will produce risk adjusted returns. But the more they do that, the more capital flows into that exact kind of strategy and the harder it is to put on big trades, especially if capital is not flowing just into the fund you're at, but also the funds your direct competitors are at. So in that sense, it will it will probably peak or perhaps like the alpha has peaked, but headcount has not peaked. And, you know, eventually, eventually it may just be a sort of white collar version of a factory job like you you know exactly what you need to do. You get more and more replaceable as more and more of the the stuff that you work on is part of some pre-existing system and you're going through a checklist and you're you're doing like the standard roster of, um, of channel check calls or whatever. So so maybe maybe compensation per person goes down, but it does remain a, a large and maybe even growing job category. If you think about a, um, the, way, the way I think about total investment returns is if you think about a chart, like Y equals MX plus C chart, right? A triangle where um, just imagine that to be a stock chart or the market chart that goes up linearly, um, all the money, all the area under the triangle, area under the curve is the sum total of the money that the market makes. The chart is never perfectly linear, right? It bounces up and down. Think of it as like a zigzag line, um, more, more than just like a straight line. And alpha is the difference between the zigzag and that true linear. So theoretically, all the money in the market that's ultimately made is basically beta, right? If I am making alpha, someone else is losing to beta and it's a zero sum game. Um, so what you tend to see a lot happen is during periods of very high volatility, hedge funds actually make more money because with high volatility, the deviation from beta is higher and almost by definition, the total amount of alpha is going to be higher, right? So. Um, the peak pot, like, are we at a point where there's so many pots that we cannot have more? I think implicitly the question that's being, uh, that's being embedded in that, in that question is, uh, where is the total amount of volatility today? Because if total volatility in the market keeps going up, then you could actually have more pots. And I would actually argue that volatility has been going up because um, fundamentally interest rates are higher. And there is, there is a not so subtle correlation where at high interest rates, you tend to have higher volatility. People tend to have more options um, on what they want to invest in. So at a high interest rate level, you actually want to see more pods because alpha generation is potentially higher. Will interest rate come down over time and will it become more difficult? Absolutely. Um, then the question is, are they able to leave this world of you know equity beta and move into something else? Um, and diversify those returns so they can find volatility in alpha in other sectors. But theoretically, if the market went up in a perfectly linear line, then I would argue that you would have no business running a pot shop. Fortunately, that day would never, never come. Yeah, like that, I think that, that point that alpha sums to zero before taxes and transaction costs is really important. That if you, if you are actually making above average returns, it's because someone sold low when you bought low and someone bought high when you sold high. And so part of what hedge funds depend on is just a supply of people who are some combination of valuation and sensitive or just really bad at, bad at whatever trades they're making. And the problem with relying on that is that that is, that is always attracting other traders to take to the market to take advantage of the same opportunities. Like there's a there's a line in um, the laws of trading about how um, alpha and something something to the effect of um, alpha doesn't last forever. And that's true of positive and negative alpha. So like an example of negative alpha would be if you are running a large pension fund and every two weeks you're like the employees at your company get paid and so they automatically deposit money in the pension and you just like that morning buy everything like right right then you could you do a market order for everything like 
the, the particular things you're going to buy, they're all going to go way up and then drop down. But over time, traders will start to notice that every two weeks, these particular markets and these particular stocks go way up. So they will start buying it the day before and selling it to you the next day. And that mutes your price impact. So it's actually, um, if you were trying, if you are deliberately trying to lose money systematically, you will eventually find that it's impossible. Eventually there's, there's so much competition to take your money that there won't be enough money. Like, yeah, it will, it will equilibrate to the point where you just have to trade a lot. So you're generating a lot of commissions or you have to be as deliberately random as you can be. But it's like, it has to be true. Like if it's, if it's possible to deliberately lose a lot of money, not from transaction costs, but from the trades that you make, then all you have to do is think of what you do to deliberately lose money, do the opposite of that. And you will automatically make money. <laughs> someone who can consistently lose money is is someone who can also consistently make money because in the public markets you yes. can just flip flip the sign on any trade you want. So it's almost impossible yeah, to lose, lose money. Like I know I know we're we're a little over time, but this this ties into the idea of alpha alpha capture, where the funds. This is one of the things that these multi manager funds will do is they they will analyze every decision that their portfolio managers make, and they'll figure out what is this manager good at, what are they bad at, like, what kinds of situations, what kinds of companies, like. Some people, sometimes there's one particular stock that's just their white whale, like they will have a view on NVIDIA earnings every quarter and they're usually wrong, but it's always their biggest position coming into that earnings report and they just lose money. And so you can eventually, you can build a portfolio that looks at the decisions PMs make and then figures out how confident that portfolio should be in those decisions. And based on that, builds like the meta portfolio of if these people were perfectly calibrated and perfectly self-aware about their own strengths and weaknesses, what would the firm wide portfolio look like? And, um, and that could be like, in theory, that means that someone who is persistently bad at a particular stock or particular situation can actually be valuable for the firm as a whole. And, um, this, this like leads to this weird Marxist alienation from your labor, where if you find out that you had a really lucrative financial career and it was entirely because you were really, really bad at Netflix earnings or something, but you were so bad that the quant model realized it would just fade you in much larger size every single time and make money. Like that's gotta be a depressing realization, but someone, someone someday will probably come to that realization that they were just so reliably bad in certain situations that they actually made their employer money. Yeah, and every multi-manager has one of these books, right? It's colloquially termed the, the master book. The, gearing towards closing here, is there any idea that we didn't get to that you want to make sure to get to express on, the, on this episode? I think one is that it's fun. Like it is, it is extremely fun to feel like you are always in the flow, in the mix, that when something happens, you had a pretty good sense that it would happen. And if it was a total surprise to you, that you can be among the first people in the world to figure out like the first 80% of the implications for this thing and position accordingly. Like that's a really fun feeling. Uh, it is definitely not the average feeling. Like on average, you feel like I have no ideas and I'm not doing as well as I hoped this year. And this is incredibly stressful. And like all the news is just random bad news. It's like you walk into the office and just get hit in the face. But um, on occasion, it's, it's extremely fun. And um, I think like, a lot of the most gratifying things people do. There are these these brief peaks where it's really, really great, but you get to those peaks through ongoing stress and suffering. But if you learn to enjoy that, then you're great. You're golden. Uh, I, I think I think the, the the job itself, I agree with Bern, is, is incredibly fun. You get so much control um, over how to think about the, the world that you want to think about it. Uh, one of the unique things about working at a hedge fund that you don't see in a lot of other careers is just how different the days could be. Um, you're just your day to day because you are playing in a world of extreme uncertainty, right? You're ultimately making decisions about um, very, very uncertain events. Um, and you're making decisions where being wrong 45% of the time puts you at the top of the world, right? And if in those situations, um, your life is your life is pretty different. So if you care about intellectual honesty and you care about doing things that are, are different every day, you try something new, um, it's, actually, it's actually a great seat. The downside of being in a seat where things are different is that when things are bad different, uh, they can get really bad different, right? The level of stress is very high. The predictability of what happens tomorrow is really not there. And um, I think a lot, of, a lot of people fail to recognize how bad things can get and how much volatility can hurt um, your personal life. So, um, yeah, that's... 
And it's interesting because we've seen some hedge funds, you know, mentioned Tiger, you know, D1, others start venture practices and, and maybe some venture firms, exp, you know, exp, experiment with with invest, with public investing as well, Sequoia and, and some others. And it would be interesting to see if there's more um, sort of, you know, sort of uh, going across the aisle, so to speak, because venture is also a, a sector where or, or, or trade where if you're wrong, you know, 45 or 50 percent of the time, you're you're still you're, you're doing fantastic or you could be doing fantastic. And also. Uh, one major difference is that the feedback loops are just way longer. Um, so you don't know if you're a venture investor for, for many years where, where you, you find out, you know, um, on, a, on a shorter time frame. The um, maybe one last question is, uh, Bern, to say more about sort of the the what's in, what do you find interesting about the age uh, as it relates to, you know, when people are, 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 are good at hedge fund investing and, and maybe the hours they work as well? Yeah, it's just um, it is an industry with a fairly high level of burnout. And so a lot of people enter the industry early to mid 20s and are out by their 30s. It's really hard to get back in after that. Um, and, and so that that I think one of the effects of that is that typically like at a lot of funds, the median employee has not actually seen an entire market cycle like they've seen the the good part because they got hired um, and they usually get hired when times are good. And then um, when there is a negative cycle, it's uh, it's often often quite a shock and quite uh, quite interesting, uh, quite an interesting experience. And there are like little cycles within that. But um, I think those those can actually be kind of deceptive. Like um, there was this point in in Q4 of 2018, where there were some worries about recessions and a bunch of the big growth stocks did really badly. And NASDAQ was down like 20 percent in over the quarter or something like that. And um, to to some people I knew this, this felt like, oh man, this is like, this is it, this is the end. And this is what the apocalypse feels like. And then the next year was great. Um, and so I think that gives a very misleading view of what an actual downturn feels like. And then 2022 was more of an actual downturn. It was more like Things are going down, like stocks are going down. They're also reporting worse earnings in part because they are each other's customers. And so you've got multiple compression and a lower revenue number and multiply that multiple by. And suddenly you're learning like, what is EBITDA? And what does it mean? Um, you know, how, how can you, can you, is it possible to cut expenses to the point that you could get a growth company to break even on the assumption that you won't ever raise any more money? Or if you do, it's on really, really bad terms. So, um, being able to being able to flip your your viewpoint around really quickly and decide what matter like decide that a new thing matters is a really important skill and it's something where people do it a lot within a cycle on kind of minor stuff like um you know on on netflix for example it was more of a net subscriber edition story for a long time and then became more of a revenue story and you know it was also partly a margin story but um if you have to you have to be able to change your mental bottle really fast when there's a quarter where like you got the net ads number right, but the revenue number was wrong and the stock reacted more to revenue than net ads. Like you have to very quickly tell yourself, like the thing I was really good at predicting actually does not matter as much as this other thing. And so now I have to get good at predicting that. And it's when the really big shifts happen of like, it's not about growth. It's actually about profitability or we can't assume infinite capital or money actually has a cost now. Don't just, uh, you know, don't do a perfunctory discount. Like you actually have to think about what is the value of 50 cents in five years versus a dollar in 10 years, um, instead of treating those as like a dollar in 10 years is worth roughly what a dollar today is worth. Like figuring, figuring that stuff out and really internalizing it is a challenge, but the people who can do that, who can last in multiple market cycles do extremely well because they, they get to be more experienced at the time, like more experienced at a time when there are more opportunities and when more people know them and trust them and they could do a lot more. Yeah, the, the, there's this saying, um, a, a smart person knows what to do and an experienced person knows the exception to what to do. Um, and the burn is absolutely right, right? The average age in a hedge fund is relatively low um, compared to many, many other industries, even like their mutual fund counterparts. Um, and what you, you tend to see a lot of is you tend to see a lot of people who work in hedge funds have had, you know, wild successes in their life to get them to where they are, right? The average profile of, you know, your analyst is, you know, the valedictorian of their high school, 
went to one of the big prestigious universities, graduated, you know, top of their class in in probably finance or economics, um, went on to work for one of the big prestigious investment banks, recruited out of that investment bank, you know, one or two years in to their job to one of the big, you know, private equity shops or one of the big hedge funds. And, you know, it's it's a chain of success where, you know, you have not learned to real massive career failure in your life um, that gets you there. And all of a sudden, the measure of your success at a hedge fund has nothing to do with your ability to study really well or work really hard or, or anything like that. It's, it's all these things that we talked about before, which are not really directly correlated with educational success, if you think about it, or career uh, early career success. When you work for a place like Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, where you know, hard work really is more reflective of success than, than anything else, and you go to a hedge fund and hard work is... Is not uncorrelated, but working harder definitely does not get you more alpha, right? Because if that were to be true, everybody would just be working twenty hour days. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's the big realization, and the experience piece is where that kicks in, right? And a lot of the junior guys who haven't had the experience of failure uh, will have a tendency to make decisions where the senior guys will look at it and say, like, that's all well and good, but if this were to happen, then we're in, then you are in a world of hurt. Right, and your career ends. Um, let's uh, let's wrap on that that sober sober note. Uh, Th- Thomas, thanks for for joining the the riff with, with Brent and I. It's been a fascinating deep dive into into all things hedge funds. Yeah, thank you for doing this uh, podcast. I've, I've I, I know you, there's only been two episodes out there, or is it three now? I don't know. Um, three. But I've been listening to it. It's three. Yeah, it's it's great. I, to awesome. to be honest, like I I didn't say this in the email, but. I, I, I'm, I used to listen to the Allen podcast a bunch. I basically have stopped listening to the Allen podcast right now. And part of that is because it started out really like deep level, like diving, conversational diving into com- stuff like what you guys are basically doing. And now it's just like them shitting on politics, which I find extremely frustrating because they, I feel like they alienated such a big core part of the audience, which is if I want to listen to politics, I will turn on CNN or Fox News and like I can get my fair dose of that. But there isn't a place where I can hear a bunch of really smart people get really deep on a particular topic. Um, and yeah, that was the all-in podcast for me, and it no longer is. And I feel like you guys are really filling the gap. Awesome. Yeah. Great, uh, great Oops, to hear. Please don't start hitting on the, uh, the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. <laughs> we'll be, yeah, we swear ourselves to political agnosticism. Like, I, yeah. I, I've done that as like a deliberate strategy of like, I, I know I'm guaranteed to irritate half my audience and then um, end up having the audience capture thing where it just get more and more extreme to cater to the other half. And then, yeah, you just end up being interchangeable with a partisan media thing. And you're putting the money. Yeah. I mean, I know why they do it, right? They, you know, they do it because just like any startup, they're trying to get massive like listener growth. And the fastest way to get listener growth is to talk about very touchy, uh, hot topic subjects like that. Sure, you can alienate half your half your user base, but you also get the other half that weren't listening to listen to you right away. Um, I get why they're doing it. It's just not a podcast for me, you know. And I'm sure I'm not the only person who who thinks that, right? You guys might think that way too. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for listening to the riff. Please go follow and subscribe. Give us five stars, and check out Burns' excellent newsletter, The Diff, if you haven't already. 